right, good morning or afternoon, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, once again, thank you so much for joining this week's episode of Net DevOps Live. Joining us today is Stuart Clark, back to talk about streaming telemetry and the value of real-time analytics for the network and how this fits into our architectures as they go through. I'm personally really excited to learn about this technology as it's one I haven't had a chance to dive deep into myself, and so I thank Stuart for joining us. As always, if you've got questions during the session, please use the Q&A panel. We'll go ahead and answer those as we go through and tackle all of them as they go in. And if you're looking for the webinar resources, they are posted up on the website for this episode, and I'll drop a link to that inside of the chat window shortly after we get started. And you can find the slides and other kind of links to areas where you can dive deeper into the topics that we're talking about today. With that, I'll hand it over to Stuart to take it away. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Hank. Welcome to this session. As Hank was mentioning, this is a really good session here. This is streaming telemetry, the value of real-time analytics for the network. I'm Stuart Clark, Network Automation Evangelist. So let's kick this one off. So as always, we start with our game plan and what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about here the current state of SNMP, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. The streaming telemetry gains. What's the benefit here of switching from SNMP over to streaming telemetry? Where do gRPC and NetConf fit in here? This is a really great question of, you know, how do we differentiate between the two and how do they fit into streaming telemetry? Then we're gonna look and explore platforms like Elk and Grafana. If you're not familiar with those, these are great open source platforms to work with. And then as the last stop, we're going to um, see how streaming telemetry is enabled and what you need to do to get this up and running on your devices. So without further ado, let's look at our current network visibility. So currently, um, a lot of network visibility is SNMP, syslog, or the command line interface. And these are three things as a, you know, a network engineer, you'd be all very sort of familiar with, and you'd be familiar with them in various different systems as well. However, we find these things can be too slow incomplete, network specific, or hard to operationalize. So when we look into a couple of these things, let's start with linking SNMP with being too slow. How many times have you been there when you've had a, a network issue and somebody's flagged the issue to you, it might be a colleague, a coworker, or even worse, your manager, and you've checked your monitoring, and then as soon as someone's flagged it to you, your SNMP has then flagged you the issue. So this becomes rather reactive than proactive, right? So we're finding out from you know, another source besides our network management, um, what, what's going on. And it really shouldn't be that way. The last thing we want is our customer calling us up and then saying that something's happened and you know, we're waiting for our, our, our sort of SNMP or monitoring to catch up. Then when you look at things like syslog, uh, we can get things like incomplete messages. It doesn't, really it doesn't really give us the complete picture. And my experience with syslog is, and I'm sure all of you have had this issue where you've had your sys syslog server and it's run out of memory and you've gone back to look at previous events or something and the syslog server, just the information just isn't there. Uh, and you can't provide that. You're writing an RCA or a CLCA for an incident and the information's just not there. CLI, as we know, the command line interface is, is very network specific, and I've listed this under hard to operationalize. You can automate and send commands via the CLI, or you can go really old school now and log into those devices and hit a bunch of show commands. But when you're scaling out your you know, devices and you've got tens, maybe hundreds of devices, logging into all of these devices and, and checking them at once, it's really laborious, it's very difficult to do, and what you're doing is you're trying to paint that picture in your mind as to, to what's going on here. And you're gluing all these pieces together and it can take a little bit of time just to figure out what's going on. So that pretty much brings the state of what you know we know as our current network visibility of today. And so here I want to cover um, SNMP polling and how I would describe this as kind of an all hands to pumps. In SNMP, we have um, two kinds of entities. We have managers and agents. In this scenario, I'm listing the um, router here as, as, the, as the agent. And then we have the, the managers I've depicted there on the right-hand side. 
The manager is essentially a server running some kind of software system that can handle management traffic. Um, and managers are often referred to as a NMS or Network Management Solutions if you see that acronym floating around. And they're responsible for polling and receiving traps against our network, such as routers and switches, firewalls, load balancers. And the other entity which I listed out there on the right hand side um, is a piece of software that runs on the network device you are managing. In this one I, I've listed it as a router but this could be a separate program like a daemon on Unix or something. But this one here that I'm listing out is now incorporated into the operating system so as what you'd find on a, a Cisco XR or an iOS router. Today most of the devices come with SNMP agents built into them and the agent provides uh, management information to the MSS keeping track of all various operational aspects of the devices and the agent on the router is able to keep track of things that we know about like the state of its interfaces like for example which one is up and which one is down and we can even track protocols and things like that and CPU these are all familiar things that we are, are there but SNMP is really, really working hard to give us all of this information to us. And this is the side effect of pushing SNMP hard. As most of you have seen, when you're pushing SNMP hard, you're going to increase the CPU on your devices. So you want to set it at a, you know, a, a rate where you're getting the information back and it becomes this fine balance of the information that you're getting back to how much load you're able to put on your devices. I've been fortunate to work in some really big networks in my time and some really mission critical networks, pushing loads and loads of data. But as we know, bandwidth comes at a cost. It isn't free, there is load somewhere. And the end user really doesn't think about this, but us as engineers, we do. This becomes our, our pretty much our living, things that we monitor daily and things that we care about. And we want to care about these things. So here's a great example for you, is that I was working in a network and we were running some firewalls and we onboarded a whole new bunch of customers onto the solution and our firewalls crept from 70% all the way up to 80%. And now you're sort of getting into that red line territory. You don't want to be there because it only takes that little sort of event to trip over into really dangerous territory and cause outages. And when you're pushing your firewalls at 80% and you're putting your maximum load of traffic through them, the business and the leadership and the management become concerned because they certainly don't want an outage. And so the way to do this is to then increase your SNMP polling. So you're trying to get the data as quickly as possible. As I mentioned right at the top of the slide, we want to be um, more proactive and not reactive to our, our, our networks. And the last thing we want again is that customer calling us up to saying that they're experiencing packet loss or an issue here. And it's down to things like things like CPU, which is causing this issue. And so it often comes down from the business standpoint that we want to increase the monitoring thresholds and we bring it down from 15 minutes down to five minutes to try to give us a lot more insight and a lot more uh, reactiveness to be able to react to those events more, more proactively here. But by pushing SNMP too hard, we can add, it can be the straw that breaks the camel's back. So in many ways, we are then uh, as, as essentially then the root cause of our own problems. And we push SNMP too hard, we push the device too hard, and that can just tipple it. Just that little much and causes the outage that we were trying to so dearly avoid in the first place. So this is where we look at the new, new solution which we're speaking about today of streaming telemetry. And I have labeled this the streaming telemetry gains because as far as I'm concerned, this is all gains here. We are gaining so much by implementing and going down the line of, of streaming telemetry. So before we kick into the fundamentals of streaming telemetry, we want to look at a little bit of a definition and I like to start off with definitions because I'm somewhat of a historian and a wordsmith and I like to understand a little bit where these words kind of come from. So I've put the little definition up there that I found on, um, on Wikipedia and you've got the noun there. Telemetry is a noun. Telemetry is an automated communications process by which measurements and other data are collected at remote or inaccessible points and transmitted or receiving equipment for monitoring. 
interestingly enough okay yep yeah, i get that i know I, I know what telemetry is in the workplace today and how it how the advances happen in the network but what i didn't know was is that the, the word telemetry is actually uh, derived from greek roots tele remote and metron measure that's a little fact for the day there if you want to slip that in if it goes quiet in the snug tonight and you want to impress someone with your telemetry knowledge so let's now go one step further and look here towards the fundamentals of of streaming telemetry streaming telemetry is a push and not a pull which is great for performance as we spoke about right at the top of the hour here Streaming telemetry solves a lot of performance issues. And it gives us advances and things to do with more tool chains. As you know now that DevOps and NetDevOps is all about the tools, and I'm really passionate about those tools. For years as a network engineer, I didn't own the tools. The tools were somebody else's um, department for them to work with. In fact, we actually had a tools team and you logged a ticket with them. But locking tickets with tools teams and having them do all the work for you is kind of counterproductive. You want to own everything. You want that ownership and you want that visibility. And so now we're able to take advantage of all these options and deliver the tools. This provides analytic ready data. And what does analytic ready data mean? Is that analytic ready data can help with network automation, traffic optimization and prevent troubleshooting. Again, as we said before, there's a lot of troubleshooting involved in networks and we can really help prevent this. So for example here, streaming telemetry can report in real time on things like packet drops, high utilization on links, and this information can then be used by network automation platforms to provision new paths and optimize traffic over our network. This is something that is actually really familiar to me here in that when a network event occurs, you don't really want to log into that device and then make a change and possibly swing traffic over to another link or do some load balancing or load sharing, update prefixes or something like that. We can now do this with automation and this is really cool here. We know we're coming away again from that sort of firefighting mentality that all of us are so used to and allowing the tool chains and the analytic ready data to do and the automation to do this all for us. And this really brings about the data model driven or um, MDT as it's called. And that's automation. Uh, Hank, I just wanted to pause here. Is there any questions coming in? Nope, we're in good shape. Everybody's oh, absorbing okay. your, your wonderful <laughs> pieces. Thank you, buddy. Yeah. Okay, let's move on here. Streaming telemetry data. Streaming telemetry data is, is described using Yang. And if you're familiar with Yang, it's a structured data modeling language, which can be encoded in JSON, XML, or GBP, Google Protocol Buffers. If you're not familiar with um, GBP, uh, Google Protocol Buffers, fear not, I have a dedicated slide for, for this coming up. This is then all streamed over TCP, UDP, or GRPC. Now that's another new one. We're very familiar with TCP and UDP, GR, G G R C P. if I can get my teeth in and say it right, is a fairly new one. And we're going to learn a little bit about this coming up as well. So data models, what, when, and where? Great questions. We've got open config. Um, in terms of configuration management, vendors are using IETF open config and or native Yang models, which describe configuration hierarchies and the supported features are using Yang. These Yang models are then encoded in XML, as was mentioned before, and transferred using NetConf, or you can use the other protocols that I was speaking before, like gRPC or even RESTConf. OpenConfig is an interesting one. It's an initiative that was actually led by Google and other OTTs and operators to define common Yang models that vendors should support to configure mission critical features like BGP, BGP policies, interfaces, VLANs. And with the push of this consortium of operators and OTT, vendors such as Cisco and other vendors out there are support, starting to support open config Yang models. And you can find all of these open, Yang, um, um, open config Yang models on devices um, such as Nexus and XR and IRSXE already. The next one is actually native. 
So what I mean by native is, is native is that each vendor pushes its own Yang models which describe how to configure the device. So this is the configuration state and how to retrieve the information from the device which we then refer to as the operational state. As we mentioned, these are commonly known as um, native Yang models and these are modules that bind the same language structure and schematics. However, each vendor does describe their own node. So it's interesting to know that when you move into the native uh, data model that each vendor is specifically different. This is why some people do opt for the open config model. With streaming telemetry, you subscribe to your data and you can stream your data at a high frequency. Now this is super cool because now we're able to uh, stream the data from our device giving us a much deeper granular insight to what is actually happening within our networks and systems. And not only that, we can actually stream data from the control plane, the data plane, and even the system plane. This is really cool. For a lot of the time, we wasn't really able to access a lot of these data. It was a very monolithic look of what we were seeing happening. So moving forward now, we're going to talk a little bit about the telemetry um, streaming methods. And here we have cadence driven. There's two things here. There's cadence driven and there's event driven. And the two aren't dissimilar, but they do serve different purposes to us. The data from the described data set is streamed out to either a destination configured at periodic intervals or when an event occurs. And so this is the difference between cadence driven and event driven. If you want to simplify it down a little further, you could think about cadence driven monitoring your uplink to say your ISPs, where you're monitoring an aggregated link and you're monitoring the bandwidth going over there. Let's say for example, you've got 220 gig links which are aggregated and by average you're doing 20 gigs of data. But then there's a big surge in data like a sporting event that's taking place and a lot of people are streaming data from your network. We would soon see that increase quite substantially here. And so cadence driven is going to give us that insight to watch that, uh, that uh, stream, the streaming telemetry and the data methods rise. So you'll actually see as the users begin to consume more data, the cadence driven feeding this data back to us till we can actually see this. And then we have event driven. An event driven or event based telemetry, EDT as it's commonly referred to, is when an event happens. And we can monitor things like interface up downs again, interface statistics, um, say BGP, um, BGP flaps, BGP routing, and all of those kind of cool things that we want to see. The configuration for event-based tele uh, telemetry is similar to that as cadence-based telemetry, only with the sample interview as the differentiator here. So what you do is you configure the sample inter value in, um, sorry, interval value to zero which sets the subscription for event-based telemetry. And by setting it to zero, you're going to see those events happen. While configuring the interval to any non-zero value sets a subscription for cadence-based telemetry. And this was mentioned just a little bit further up in the, in the previous slide, where we're wanting to stream, say, telemetry quite aggressively and get information back from our devices in almost real time here. This is where we would then change that value to get the data at the rate that we wanted to see it, the rate that actually suits our needs. I promised you in another last slide that I wanted to talk about GBP encoding. Don't let this slide put you off, please. There is a lot of information about GBP and you can go really, really deep in here. But the idea is, is just to give you a little bit of an oversight of what you can actually expect and what GBP actually does here. I will cover GBP just a little bit further down as well as we're going into this as how it's um, set up. As you can see here, GBP stands for Google Proto uh, Protocol Buffers. And these are some of the design goals on the left hand side that they look for. Sim simplicity, performance, forwards and both backwards compatibility. And some of the non-goals which were actually listed for Google was this being human readable, self-describing or, or, or text based. Google's protocol buffers are a neutral, um, a language neutral, and they're platform neutral as, that as well. They are an extensible mechanism here for serializing structured data. 
So if you think about it like XML, but faster and smaller and simpler, and here you define how you want your data to be structured. And then once you have done this, you use a specialized generated source code to easily write and structure the data to go from a variety of data streams using a variety of languages. Which leads us to the question, okay, what languages are supported here with GBP? Looking into this, currently supported for this is Java, Python, Objective-C, C++, and there's a new Proto3 language version, which you can also use with Dart, Go, Ruby, and more languages are to come. So if you go through the uh, GBP encoding documentation, there's some really great information in there about how to get started with all of these all of these protocols. The other one that I mentioned at the top again was uh, NetConf encoding and this does vary a little bit from um, uh, Google protocol buffers. NetConf um, encoding here, a lot of this information I pull from RFC 5277 and you can get a lot of information from the RFCs just going through them and, and reading about the kind of things like the design goals and stuff. And I've outlined the sort of distinction between configuration and state, multiple configuration data stores, so candidate running and startup, configuration change transactions. And if you're doing any form of network automation using NetConf, all the things on the left hand side will be really familiar with to you. When we talk about candidate and running and startup configuration, these are things that we know and find on, on th such things as say routers or switches. In the right hand column, we have configuration testing and validation support, selected data retrieval with filtering. And, and the one that I'm most interested in is streaming and playback of event notifications here. So when a NetConf client subscribes to an event stream, a uh, user defined filter element, um, if applicable, these are applied to our event stream and matching event notifications are forwarded to a NetConf server for a distribution to subscribe NetConf clients. When you look at how streaming telemetry is set up on a device, it does very much vary from what we'll see a, a little bit later, later on. And there's only really one line, of, one line of syntax to actually to get this to be enabled, as we'll see when we start to look a bit further into dial-in and dial-out configurations. So moving forward here, I want to talk now on open source tools. And you saw at the start there, we were talking about what we're going to talk about today is uh, the, the, the two main ones or the two main game players which we see kind of in, in people using today. And the open source tools here are instead of what we talked about with the SNMP uh, manager right at the top of the hour, instead of polling the data from the network devices, the telemetry, um, the telemetry collector subscribes to the streaming data and pushes the data source in the network. So this is really interesting and a much more different approach than what we're used to. So let's talk about the different um, collection models here. You've got the BYOD, the custom stack. You might find that if you're working in a large company that often the, there isn't a tool out there that suits the needs. You can't find one in open source and you don't wanna buy one off the shelf. So a lot of the time a custom stack one is, is, is built and a dedicated team there is stood up to actually have these build your own sort of devices. And this is a very familiar situation to a lot of us who have worked in uh, engineering for a long, long time that something doesn't quite suit the needs, so we build our own thing. And this has its advantages and it has its disadvantages. And then we have the open source customizable ones. So I'm listing a couple of these up here. We've got Cabana, Elasticsearch, Grafana, Prometheus, and we've got Panda, and these all integrate with Logstash and Kafka, which you might be familiar with. And these are open source products which you can get, and then you can customize them to your use case. And then finally, we move into the proprietary and commercial stack. So these are the ones that you tend to find is that you will buy from a specific vendor. And we've been there with um, SNMP tools, if you're familiar with things like SolarWinds or What's Up Gold or something. That's what I'm referring to by a commercial stack. It's something that you buy where all of the legwork is done for you and you just add the, you know, the, conf the minor configurations to get this up and running and to see all the stats across your network. These are the kind of three things that we've got, the custom stack, open source and customizable, and then the finally the commercial stack. And each one has a different place. 
Um, your mileage may vary and you might want to use open source, you might want to build your own, or you might decide to go down the commercial stack. Each of them has its pros and cons, and when you're investigating and looking for the different collection models, these are the things that you kind of look into to decide which one you want and which one is going to suit your needs the best. So we're going to kick off with this one and look at the uh, Elastica stack. And this is a really popular open source stack. When you bre um, break this down, ELK, the K stands for Kiban um, Kibana. And this is the, um, find this in the ELK stack. And it's a very, very popular open source log analysis platform providing users with tools for exploring and visualizing, visualizing data and building dashboards on top of the log data store. And this uses Elastica clusters to be able to achieve this. We use various methods where users can search the data index in Elasticsearch for specific events or strings within their data for root cause analysis and di diagnostics. So if you're looking into like a historical event or where something goes down, this is a really great tool for doing this. And you can go in there and search out and find out why CPU spiked and correlate that data and actually pull it all up for you in just one single pane of glass. You're able to get all that information there Remember we talked right again at the top of the hour of the going into the CLI doing that. Well, now we're using these tools in our, in our arsenal of tool stack to be able to find all this information for us. And we can just go in there, search the logs and find all the information that we need. This could be based on timestamps or you can use keywords or something like that down to device level, interface level. Um, if you're searching via IP, you can go in and search via IP. There's a, a lot of things in there. There is two different versions of this. There's both the commercial and cloud via Elastica Co. And you can actually download the repo for this like you can with many open source tools. And the great thing about open source is if, if you've been on any of our Net DevOps webinars that we've been running, we talk a lot about open source and how you can contribute to these, which is really, really cool. So you're kind of interfacing one on one with the developers of all these things. And you're being part of that kind of proactive community, which personally, I really like being a part of. Moving forward into our other option here is Grafana, which is another popular tool. Um, Grafana, as it says on the slide there, is an open source visualization tool that can be used on top of a variety of different data stores, but is most commonly used with Graphite. We was a big user of Graphite in my last business unit, InfluxDB, and also you can use Elasticsearch with this and, and Logs.io as well. As before, where we saw the commercial and we saw the cloud version, you can get the enterprise and cloud versions here. And data is stored as the documents here. We have a full text search and, and log management as well. And like again, as many open source tools here, you can go into the GitHub and you can be part of that community. And this is where you get your update for your codes and you can interface in there. The often the question before we look and move on with this is well which one is the best one for me to use and we talked a little bit in the last slide about the 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 uh, your mileage kind of may vary and you do have to look at each case individually of which one you might want to use you might even want to use both but the key differences are the visualizations tool um, stems from their purpose and grafana is really designed for analyzing and visualize visualizing metrics like systems and CPU, memory, disk, IO utilization. There is a slight difference in the um, accessibility to sort of something like a full text um, data querying. Cabana, on the other hand, runs on top of the um, Elasticsearch a, lot, a little bit more strongly and it is pr primarily used for analyzing log messages. So I think if you're looking to go down that log messaging route that Cabana is um, is, is the good choice, but if you're building a monitoring system, both will do the job really, really well. Um, if it's logs you're after, I am gonna lean a little bit more heavily up towards Cabana in this one for troubleshooting, forensics, development, and security. I think Cabana gives that a little bit more flexibility in those options. But I did stress at the start of that, your mileage may vary, my personal opinion based on what I've seen so far. So here we go. We're going to go down now into the, the last stop. The last stop is a little bit long, so please bear with me. There is a little bit of ground to cover here. And we're going to talk about configuring model-driven telemetry here, MDT. 
just before I jump into this slide, Hank, I just want to touch bases with you, buddy. Is there any questions coming in? Uh, we've had a, we've had a couple, but nothing that you got to cover. We're in good shape now. I appreciate that, my friend. So, before we begin, is this familiar to people? It should be. Okay. When I started out my network journey some number of years ago, I'm there with my CCNA book, and there's a lot of things that we have to memorize. Things like RFC 1918 address space is often the first one, or even before that, the OSI model. And then we begin to commit a lot of these things to memories. As engineers, I found we have vast memories and we're able to recall things very, very quickly. And we need to as part of our job. As we moved on from remembering the OSI and the RFC 1918 address space, we went a little bit further and a little bit more advanced in our careers and we started to memorize things like BGP attributes. And I love being able to rattle off those BGP attributes because it helped me when I was troubleshooting all the time. Then there's things like the finite machine in, in um, uh, BGP. And then we move up the layer a little bit further. IPv6 addresses. I don't know about you, but when IPv6 addresses came out, they made me scratch my head. And I was used to remembering the multicast addresses with IPv4, which were very similar to me. But then when IPv6 came along and I started to memorize some of these addresses. So when I was troubleshooting, I kind of knew what I was looking for. Then we move a little bit step further, and this is the, the, the really separates that expert level there, when then when you start talking about LSA type messages and OSPF areas. As I was mentioning, we store all of this information in there. But does anybody really memorize all of the ORDs? There must be thousands. So when you're looking at an ORD, how, how do you know which one you're looking for? Often you're led onto documents and Am I picking the right OID for the job here? It became really critical when I was working in a network environment with people asking me for the um, right OIDs. Is this the right OID that I'm using, they would say. We're not getting the right data coming back. And often it's a, a, a case of just trying them out and you have to configure the OID, let the data come through and just to see the difference and see if you're getting the, you know, the desired effect or actually what you want. So if I really dig deep back into my memory here, I can actually break a little bit of this down. So starting on the far left hand side, you've got one which stands for ISO and that's the group that establishes the OID standards. The three stands for the org and that'll be specific. Six there, which you see stands for DOD, as you'll know, it's the Department of Defense. One stands for internet. Four is for private, meaning that this is a manufactured by a private entity, i.e. not a government agency. And there one is enterprise. And that's the device manufacturers as described by the enterprise. And that's me pretty much done there. Those are the kind of like the one, two, three, four, six things that I was able to remember with SNMP. But remembering the rest of them, boy, that's a really, really tough job. And this is when we're looking into streaming telemetry that we want to look at something that's a little bit more easy to read and for us is a little bit more able to figure out. So when I look at the configuration for this example here, which is taken off a, um, a Cisco ISXR device, this becomes really readable, right? I can read this. Well, operational infra, statistics, okay, interfaces, good, interfaces, latest generic counters. That's fairly easy to read. Well, I don't know about you, but that's certainly much easier to read than the OID that we looked at as the example above, right? So the background here, and let's talk about the, the background. And I've put up there TLDR. First of all, we, ha we have really three main sections here. We have transport, we have the session initiator, and then we have the encoding. And we covered a little bit about encoding in one of the, in, in the previous slides. And the transport here is that the router can deliver telemetry across using TCP. We spoke a little about uh, UDP before, and a gRPC over HTTP um, version two here. And some people will prefer the simplicity of a raw TCP socket. Others will um, appreciate the optional TLS in encryption that um, gRPC brings here. Again, these are choices that you will make when looking at configuring here. And, and these are the differences which set us all apart. And again, your, your, your mileage is gonna vary of which one you actually set up and configure. 
The session initiator here, there are two options here for initiating the telemetry session. The router can dial out to the collector or the collector can dial in to the router. We will talk about dial out and, and dial in, in in the upcoming slide. The thing to remember here is regardless of which side initiates the session, the router will always stream the data to the collector at the requested intervals. It should also be noted that TCP supports dial out while gRPC supports both dial in and dial out. In the other slides we talked about encoding a little bit more and just to cover this off here and seal this up, the router can deliver the telemetry in different flavors of um, GBP, compact and self-describing GP, uh, GPB. Compact GBP is the most efficient encoding but requires a unique dot proto that we spoke about a little bit before in the slide for each Yang model that is, that is, um, that is streamed. On the other hand, the self-describing GBP is less efficient but uses a single dot proto file to include the Yang models. The, the reason for this is, is because the keys are passed in, a, um, in strings within the dot proto file. So they're just the two differences to be aware of when looking at the different types of encoding there from GBP. So now I want to dive into that great information here of um, dial in versus, um, versus dial out. And this is really cool stuff. So with the dial out method, the router initiates the TCP session to the, to the collector and then sends whatever data is specified by the sensor group in the subscription. And with the gRPC dial in method, the collector initiates a G, gRPC session to the router and specifies a subscription. The router sends whatever data is then specified by the sensor group to the subscription by the collector. If this seems a little bit sort of wordy right now, not a problem. We're going to look at the configuration. When I'm reading through a lot of the documentation for this and other things, I often find that reading the documentation is great, but I need to see that hands-on and, and how it actually works and how it's going to work within our, within our environment here. So the first thing that we're going to look at is the TCP dial-out router configuration. There's always three steps here to configure in telemetry. And first we create the, um, the destination group, the sensor group, and then we um, create the subscription. Here right at the top here, you'll see that we've created the, um, the destination group. And um, the things that we list out here is the IP address. So I'm sending my data here as IPv4 to 192.168.1.2. And I've specified the port 5432, which I'm, I'm sending. As we mentioned in the other slide, I'm sending self-describing GBP and I'm using the protocol of TCP. Once we've configured our destination group here, the next thing that we complete is our, our, um, our sender group. And the sender group specifies the list of Yang models, which are to be streamed. You know when we looked at the OID versus the, um, the streaming telemetry slide that I put up just a little bit for? This is where we actually specify this. And just for a little bit of clarity, I have listed the same one out here. And the sensor path here represents the XR Yang model for the interface statistics. And finally, we get down to creating our subscription. The subscription um, associates a destination group with the sensor and really ties this all together and sets the streaming interval. Here you'll see that I've actually set the, um, the sensor group here uh, to be configured for 30 seconds. And that's basically the three steps here to setting up TCP dialout router configuration. So if we move forward here to look at the other version, what we talked about before, where we talked about gRPC dial out, you'll see here that we again have the three sessions here. And with the G gRCP dial out method, the router initiates the gRPC session to the collector and sends whatever data is specified to the sensor group in the subscription. The steps to configure gRPC um, are pretty much as the same as the TCP um, dial out that we looked at before. If you recall, there's not a great difference. It's still the three sort of step process. So first of all, again, we create our destination group and you'll see here that I'm sending this destination to 192.168.2.1 again. And I am using uh, the port 575, uh, 57500 here. Again, I'm using the self-describing version of G, uh, GVP, but I am using the protocol GRPC here. 
and we're using that self-describing GBP. Next, we move it down, and we talked about it, this on the previous slide, where we build our, um, our sensor group. And here I've just chosen to use just a, a, a slightly different one. And the path here represents the XR Yang model for summarizing memory statistics. So I'm looking at my the memory that I'm using uh, on the box of my XR device here with this sensor path. And then finally, we create the subscription here, which ties it all together, where we list the sensor path and the destination ID. Again, I'm looking at a sample right here of, of 30 seconds. Now this which I should have mentioned, sorry, on the previous slide here, where we was talking about SNMP at 15 minute intervals, 10 minute intervals, and five minute intervals. And now I'm sending data at 30 seconds, which I hope you will agree is a really substantial cut down in time here. And finally, the last one I wanted to talk about was um, gRPC and dial, it, dial it in. We mentioned at the top of the slide here that gRPC is the only one that can do both dial in and dial out. So when using the um, gRPC dial-in method, the collector initiates the gRPC session. If you recall just a couple of slides up when we talked about the, the pushing the pull and who initiates the session kind of thing, when we got the dial-in, um, it's still the router or device switch, for example, which sends the data out no matter who initiates the session. So even though you are using a dial-in method, you dial into that router, but then the router is then sending the subsequent uh, data streams out from the box. It's not a collector going in and collecting that information from the box. The router sends whatever the data is specified by the sensor group there, which is the third thing that we were, we, we were configuring there. So to start this off here, we configure um, gRPC, and again, we're using port 57500 uh, there. Simple, pretty much line there, and that enables gRPC. And it enables the gRPC server to accept incoming connect, uh, connections from the collector. We move down then to uh, go on to the sensor group again, and we've got sensor group three here, and the sensor group is listing again the Yang models here. And this one here, for instance, as you'll see, I'm using actually the open config here. I wanted to move away a little bit on from the native and show you a um, open config example here. And this is, uh, is the open config YAM model for the interfaces. So here we're pulling, we're getting all the information about the interfaces. And then finally, we move on to the subscription here. Um, again, we're doing this as a, a 30, second, 30 second interval, but there is no destination group required because the collector will be dialing in here. So that bit of the configuration is slightly different from what we saw before on the um, uh, dial out, TCP dial out and the gRPC dial out. So what do we talk about here? And we did go over a huge volume of data, so thanks for hanging in there. We talked about the current state of play with SNMP and some of the shortfalls and some of the uh, uh, disadvantages that uh, SNMP has given us. And I kind of summarize that with some of the real world examples that I've seen in networks of the day when we pushed SNMP too hard and it's been the straw that's broken the camel's back. We looked at the streaming telemetry gains and it is really all about the gains here of the advantages that streaming telemetry can actually bring to us now. We looked at how gRPC and net, net config fit in here and I hope you've learned a little bit about how those subjects are, are different and how we use them within our configuration. We looked at the different uh, open source platforms here, Elk and Grafana, and we did a quick sort of troubleshoot of which one, which one is a, the one that we might want to pick and some of the different variations and how those are all kind of put together. Finally, our last stop on our streaming telemetry journey was how you enable streaming telemetry. And I hope you'll agree with me here that enabling streaming telemetry and getting this up and running really isn't that complicated. You can go over some of the models and find the data that you need and soon be using streaming telemetry to your advantages. So long gone are those days remembering those ORDs. And so as always, when we close out the Net DevOps, we want to give you the um, uh, resources list here so you can get up and started and you can get that sort of hands on and feel free and play around with this. On the screen, you'll see a whole bunch of links here. So we have all the different platforms here that you're familiar with. We have XR telemetry, Nexus telemetry, and ISXE telemetry. And we have all the guides there to get you started.
And we have a good number of learning labs, but one that I'm really happy with learning at the moment is the XR Stream and Telemetry one, where you can get a lot of the hands-on with the examples that I showed you. A lot of the examples that I showed you are available in the Stream and Telemetry sandbox as well, and you can configure those and, and have a go with them there. And there's a collector there for you to actually see the results as well as this, this uh, Stream and Telemetry, telemetry data is coming in and a whole great walkthrough of, of how to get up and running with all the different versions that we spoke about today. On top of this, we have the uh, Stream and Telemetry sandbox, we have the N um, Nexus Always On sandbox and the XR Programmability sandboxes for you to get, you know, that much needed hands-on experience with the streaming telemetry. So I'd like you to try the streaming telemetry boxes for yourself to get a hands-on uh, feel for them, see how it's working, and then use these labs and other guides as reference, and then create your own collectors and databases in your own environment. Once you've done that, you can submit your, your project up to us at Code Exchange and share with the community. Always interested in seeing what people are doing and submitted into Code Exchange. You get some really, really great examples in there, and some real thinkers and some real game changers come into there, which make you sit back and think, "Wow, this is really cool." And a lot of the stuff that we see here is really, really inspiring. And if you're looking for more about Net DevOps, there's a huge amount of resources here, which we're listing out on the screen of Net DevOps and DevNet and the Net DevOps live series that we've been running the blogs that we put out, and I would strongly encourage you to follow the Network Programmability Basics video course if you haven't already done so. It's a fantastic course. And there's loads of learning in there where we talk about Yang models as well. If you've got any more questions, please stay in touch. You'll see me there in my mighty Viking boat, the Valhalla there. Can't quite recall where I was sailing off to, but by the look on my face, I was having a great time. All of my contact details are there on the left-hand side. Please feel free to hit me up on my email address or Webex Teams. I constantly tweet on Twitter and put a whole bunch of content out there and my GitHub repo there on the left hand side. Stay in touch with us at Cisco DevNet here and you can keep in touch with us with the uh, developer.cisco.com. Again, we're very active on Twitter and there's the Facebook community as well. All of the code that you all often see in all of our demos is available on the um, Cisco um, DevNet GitHub page as well. And with that, guys, I'd like to thank you for attending. Absolutely. Thanks again, Stuart. We will see everybody next week in our final week in Season 1. Uh, we will talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye, everybody.